like a lot of stories, it all begins with a really bad teacher. There's lots of ways that teachers can be bad. A strict teacher isn't necessarily that bad. Neither is one that gives you a lot of things to do or asks a lot of you. I'm talking about a kind of teacher that quells curiosity and being creative, all in the name of maintaining order. That's my least favorite kind of teacher. And one of my fourth grade teachers was certainly one of the worst. Besides giving us all sorts of inaccurate science information, there was a day all the kids were encouraged to wear hats. You had hats with flowers, baseball caps, all sorts of things brought in from home from, from a parent's closet. And at the time, I thought it would be really great to wear a boot as a hat. It turns out you can really turn heads if you wear a boot on your head, and this teacher was having none of it. After my grand entrance into the classroom, she stopped everything dead, ended the applause, and told me to immediately take that shoe off of my head. She then took the moment to launch into a discussion about how wearing hats indoors contributed to an overheating of the mind and that it would cause us to be unable to process our education and our learning. So on hat day, in her classroom, the hats came off. I think the lessons she was trying to teach me at age 11 weren't the ones that I took in. Instead of thinking that hats were an inappropriate thing to do and to always work to make sure that I had good airflow to my cranium, the lesson that I took away was that clothes could earn attention and applause. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. At the time that I'm recording this podcast, I'm pretty well known for the costumes that I'll wear in public. Suits of weird colors and different kinds of fabric, having a top hat or something equivalent on my head, and being to some level fearless or at least extravagant in what I'm wearing. This goes back a very long time. In my early years, of course, I had very little say in what I could wear. It was whatever my parents got for me, and I was a child of Caldors and Sears and J.C. Penney. I wore hand-me-downs from other branches of the family, or whatever constituted acceptable child's clothing from these chains. This continued through most of my teen years. Other than having a number of unique t-shirts that were printed up with friends, I really didn't make much noise in terms of wearing something loud and bright at school for attention. The one exception was a cow suit, which I picked up as part of my high school band, Bovine Ignition Systems, and I wore it on stage a couple times. I wore it for a couple of performances and then kept it around through my college years. I used the cow suit for my caricature business, dressing up in it and going out on the streets of Harvard Square to earn money on the weekends. One of the side effects of wearing a cow suit in public is that after a while you forget that you're wearing it and you just kind of absorb people looking at you and slowing down traffic or getting people's attention. You cross a threshold of self-awareness and move on to just having the costume. By the time I'm in my early 20s, I'm perfectly trained to not notice when people are noticing my clothes. And admittedly, throughout the 90s, I would occasionally wear something unusual, perhaps shaving my head and having a tuxedo, or buying some odd hats, maybe even getting a colorful jacket here and there. But I don't think I was defined that way. 
It could have gone either way at that point. Having unusual outfits, that's really not out of the bounds of anything else. And looking back, I've tried to figure out the inflection point, the time at which something I was doing became something identified as being me. And while I'm sure some older pictures will occasionally show me dressing up oddly, it's not until I turn 40 that we start seeing my clothes become my calling card. Sometime around 40 is when people start mentioning my top hat, and when I don't wear one, they ask where it is, or if they're talking about me, they mention my wearing a top hat. What's funny to me is that the top hat was just one tool in the fashion toolbox. I was definitely refashioning myself to be a character, somebody who on stage could get attention, to start buying clothes that made people remember me and then hopefully listened to what I had to say. It's easy to dress as a clown. It's harder to dress as someone memorable or somebody willing to get your attention by dressing up exotically. From 2010 onward, I move hard into dressing for the part that people seem to want, rifling through catalogs of outfits that jump off from the page and maybe are a little bit uncomfortable to wear, but result in something looking very, very distinctive. This combined with income allowed me to start filling my closet with all sorts of exotic options. Seeing me on stage usually meant seeing me in something really colorful, really weird, even before I'd opened my mouth and hopefully captivated you with what I was trying to get across. And that, to me, was the difference between just dressing funny and making some use of that unusual dress. Clothes are a calling card. They tell you a little bit about a person before they even interact with you. They send out a message. They indicate that you're going to be getting a certain kind of conversation from somebody, or that they have certain beliefs, or that they want you to know something about themselves without them ever having to bring it up. Whatever it is that got me into this position, I've never, ever felt trapped by it. The fact is that by speaking about the serious subjects that matter to me, about preservation of history and memory and emotion and meaningfulness, they are always there. And if my audience increases by some minuscule amount, causes people to see a freeze frame of me talking and want to hear more about what this person is trying to get across, that works for me. Having gone more and more intense with my costuming, I can say that it's worked for me, but that it's not necessarily for everybody. Not everybody feels the need or wishes to dress up odd, out of the bounds. It's not a mandate, a requirement to be heard. I have listened and attended some of the best speeches from people wearing normal street clothes or a simple formal get-up reflecting that they just wanted to look good on camera. I don't think there is literally a one-size-fits-all for costuming. That said, fashion, what you wear, is to me another delightful project to reaffirm or reconfigure yourself based on what you might wear is absolutely captivating. I've enjoyed it all my life, putting on something beautiful or unusual, sometimes at the cost of comfort, sometimes at the cost of my wallet. But it is, as I say, a commitment. As I've entered my 50th year, I am continually looking online to see what other kinds of fabric, outfit, and cuts I could wear. What accessories are available to me? And in perhaps a nod to how things are in the present day, determining which vendors are real and which ones are scams, ad-supported front companies for the actual excellent products beneath, tracking them down, 
finding the actual quality items that I want to add to my closet. It's just more browsing to me. And as I look forward to the rest of my life, to the kind of outfits and costumes that I'll bring with me when I'm in public, I hope to not only wow with the actual things I'm wearing, but to follow up about what I've been passionate about, about what I've had feelings about, that will be as thrilling and as captivating as whatever I have on. And to make sure that the one good lesson that I got from that one terrible teacher will thrive in my character forevermore. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Corey Thomas, Emilio Oliveira, Matt Reynolds, Ernie Hershey, and Michael Rubin, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. That teacher wasn't the only bad teacher I've had in my school career. I did not graduate with an excellent grade point average. I didn't have a grade point average in college that I'm proud of either. To me, it was always about the people I was with, the projects that I got into, and the excitement I had about a world full of opportunities, both online and off. I was at no point sad dealing with this teacher. The fact that she was on her face, willing to give her students completely incorrect information, told me to question authority, to learn and research and not depend on just what other people told me. That simple lesson has been incredibly useful throughout my life, the present day, and way into my future.